Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me okay? Um, I've got a big voice. I probably don't need the microphone. Um, I hope you'll understand my accent. It's, uh, I come from the north of Ireland, and uh, my accent's quite strong. I gave my first lecture in the United States about 30 years ago, and the students came up afterwards and said that they hadn't understood a word that I'd said, but they really liked the way I said it. Uh, so uh, I'm, today, uh, I'm, I'm going to do something that I've never done before. Philosophy has become such a professionalized discipline uh, in the universities that uh, uh, I've tended throughout most of my, most of my career to, uh, to uh, um, give very formal papers. But uh, one of the beautiful things about coming to this conference, this is, as Joe said, that this is my third of the five conferences uh, in Osaka that I've attended with IAFOR. And uh, I've always looked forward to this, uh, partly because I've fallen in love with Japan, and partly because of the informal discussions that are facilitated outside the, the formal sessions here. Um, I quite often find the most interesting uh, aspects of the conference are the conversations that you have with people over a few beers in the evening or uh, out over dinner as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a kind of exhortation rather than a formal argument. And part of the reason for that is I'm talking about something that has really not been talked about in the Western tradition uh, for the, at least the last 800, year, 800 years, uh, 700 years. I'm going to be talking about justice as a power of the soul. Now, there has been a great revival of what's called virtue ethics within the philosoph philosophical tradition over the last 25 to 30 years. But the philosophers who have discussed the nature of the virtues have still, to a very large extent, neglected what was considered in the ancient world, particularly among the Greeks, but also among the medieval Latins, to be the cornerstone of the virtues, which is uh, the notion of justice. So I am trying to conceptualize what, what it would be like to think of justice not in the way in which we think about it nowadays, but to think of it as a power of the soul. Now this comes from a throwaway line in Plato's Republic, where Plato says, Friends have no need of justice. <clears throat> now by that, I think what he means is that friends bring justice to the nature of their engagement with their friends. They don't demand justice as some external power that's delivered by institutions or by public policy or government. It's something that you bring to situations. Now the reason I say this is an exhortation is largely because the resources we have for, for thinking about justice in this way, a very different way from the modern concepts of justice, are very, very scant. There's very little written on this. So I'm going to piece together three possible lines of thinking about justice as a power of the soul, as a virtue. Uh, and I'm going to start by very briefly delineating some of the central aspects of contemporary accounts of justice. And then I'm going to provide three little synopses, one from St. Thomas Aquinas, one from Aristotle and one from Plato, before I finally elaborate what I see to be the central difficulties uh, with this approach. Now, uh, Alistair MacIntyre uh, has given a very powerful description of the state of contemporary moral discourse, and particularly uh, in respect to justice. When he comes to elaborate the uh, the contemporary account of justice and morality, he uh, says the following. Morality is constituted by rules to which any rational person would under certain ideal conditions give assent. Secondly, that those rules impose constraints upon and are neutral between rival and competing interests. Thirdly, that those rules are also neutral between rival and competing sets of beliefs about what the best way for humans to uh, the best way for human beings to live is. Fourthly, that the units which provide the subject matter of morality as well as its agents are individual human beings, 
and that in moral evaluation, each individual is to count for one and nobody for more than one. And fifthly, that the standpoint of the moral agent constructed by allegiance to these rules is one and the same for all moral ed- agents and as such is independent of all social particularity. This is the conception of morality and justice that I want to attack uh, by looking at the virtue of justice. I'm going to do so by presenting, as I said, three scenarios. The first one, I'm working backwards from Aquinas to uh, Plato. In his discussion of justice, Aquinas breaks the, uh, the virtue of justice into several parts, the first of which he terms pietas, or piety. Now, it's very strange. This is a virtue that we no longer think of in the West for, uh, as being a central virtue, but it's one that plays a very important role in Japan, as well as a very important role within the Confucian traditions in the diaspora of, of, the, uh, of the Chinese. Now, he describes this virtue of pietas as the virtue of rendering what is due to those to whom we owe it, with particular reference to our parents, our other relatives, and our country. Now, Aquinas is calling to our attention the question, what would it be like to be a person who simply does not have the dispositions and related forms of understanding and feelings required to exercise the virtue of piety. Such a person might, for example, treat death and dead bodies with levity or disdain. Such a person is likely to find uncongenial the notion that we ought not to speak ill of the dead, and in the context of understanding specific cultures, such as that of indigenous Australians, or the Chinese or Japanese, be incapable of responding to those cultural traditions in which honoring the dead plays a central role. And it goes further, for how could such a person existentially take on board the social institution of the wake with its expression of grief and communal solidarity, something that uh, exists both in the Chinese tradition but also in the Irish tradition? And even when no clear harm is done, a just, rebu- a just rebuke delivered by an adult child to a parent may be delivered with just intentions in good and bad ways, as a preamble, for instance, in private to a further goodwilled engagement, or it can be done in front of others in order to embarrass. Respect and pietas are interrelated, but they're not the same thing. The sort of pietas or piety expressed in patriotic attachment to a country or an institution is poorly conceived if it is merely respectful. Pietas for Aquinas shades into a range of other virtues including love and loyalty. The person of pietas is a serious person who knows how to feel, who has a sense of whatsoever is grave and constant in human suffering Someone without this virtue would not know how to feel and behave. He would not fully understand what constituted insult. He would not see old age as venerable. He would lack attachment to forms, traditions, language, and liturgy. He would lack any sense of a hallowed place, any feeling for the genius loci. This means he would lack the deepest sense of community, of being born into a human tradition, of life not being his unique possession, but common to all. He would not know how to speak of the dead. Pietas involves a set of feelings and dispositions that place the individual in a rich lived context. The person who has successfully appropriated the virtue will have a sense of awe, veneration, fear, and belonging to a world and community larger than herself. Pietas is a part of the virtue of justice because it gives due weight to our social embeddedness. Pietas is extended not just to the dead and their bodies and memory, nor only to our parents, but to our teachers and mentors, uncles and aunts, 
teachers and clergy, but also to offices, and in Aquinas' view, ultimately to rulers. Now, the importance of thinking of the parts of justice as powers of the soul in Aquinas is that it reverses the priorities of contemporary accounts of justice. In order to be just and to bring out just states of affairs, we need to approach the issues from the perspective of what goes into the deliberative process. Giving due weight as exemplified by one who has successfully appropriated that part of the virtue of justice called piety to the rich array of socially embedded practices and traditions that mark much of our background, what Marx called material conditions, is a very different matter from following rules to which any rational person would under certain ideal conditions give assent, or supposing that we ought to be neutral between rival and competing interests, and also neutral between rival and competing sets of beliefs about what the best way for humans to live is. Piety requires that we do not see ourselves primarily as individuals, but rather as members of communities. It also demands the due deliberative uh, concern must be exercised into our historical and social particularity while opening the heart to new understandings. In all these ways, the understanding of piety as a power of the soul reverses the priorities established in, account, in contemporary accounts of morality and justice. Aristotle also thinks, or at least um, I think there's good reason to think that Aristotle thought of justice as primarily being a power of the soul. In Book 5 of the Nicomachean Ethics, he describes justice specifically as a state of the soul, a hexis, and it may well be argued that this orientation feeds his entire discussion of the much more elaborated account of, just, of the justice of political institutions. It is also within this context that Aristotle's account of justice becomes the prolegomenon for his discussion of friendship as the highest embodiment of justice. In one of the very few articles devoted to this notion of justice as a power of the soul, David O'Connor distinguishes a corrective account of justice from an expressive account of justice. And he notes, the corrective aspect of justice is the virtue's negative side telling us what it guards against, while its expressive side tells us the positive side of what human capacities it brings into play and perfects. The virtue of justice in Aristotle involves a certain orientation of the soul, and this is brought out most clearly when he discusses the misorientations associated with injustice. Aristotle follows Plato in referring to this misorientation under the term pleonexia. Pleonexia is the name for a fundamentally disordered desire. In the politics, Aristotle deliberates on what institutional measures might be needed to prevent stasis or civil conflict and injustice. Phileas of Chalcedon had thought that if we were to institutionalize equality of property, then the possibility of stasis or conflict and injustice would be removed. And Aristotle's reply here is very, very instructive. He says, even if one were to instantiate moder moderate property for all, it would not help. One ought to level desires rather than property. For if people's desires go beyond necessities, they will commit injustices to satisfy them. It is the task of education, then, to school desires, and such schooling requires an orientation, a turning of the soul away from the love of money and honor as ends in themselves. Pleonexia involves a disregard for an inclination to beat objective limitations. Injustice is the manifestation in the practical sphere of psychic misorientation. If our orientations are ordered and anti pleonexic the propensity to treat others unjustly in practical matters, Aristotle believes, would dissipate. Clearly, an account of justice as a power of the soul must give an account not just of what vices must be overcome, the deficiencies. It must express a positive orientation. 
and it is in expressing what is diametric, sorry, and it is in expressing what is central to what justice as a virtue of the soul aims at that the Aristotelian vision sets itself as diametrically opposed to all contemporary accounts of justice. Contemporary accounts of justice emphasize our natures as individualistic and in competition with others. The Aristotelian account views the virtue of justice as contributing to a common pursuit of a shared conception of the good through excellent action. It emphasizes community. This is one reason why Aristotle thinks of friendship both as the source of political community and as the specific arena in which the virtue of justice is developed and played out. Friendship is a paradigm of a shared community of deliberation and action. Friendship, particularly virtue friendship, corrects our misorientations and perfects through love the virtues of justice. I'll move now to Plato, because as I said uh, earlier, there's very, very little written on this topic, uh, justice as a virtue of the soul in the entire Western tradition, and the greatest elaboration of what it might be like, be thought to be like, comes in Plato's Re Republic. The major thrust of Socrates' arguments in Book One of the Republic, or Politeia, is to show that there must be an internal relation between justice and power if we are to uphold and rationally ground the idea that justice is a part of human excellence. His view is based upon an experiential observation. People may be misguided about what goodness and excellence is. Nevertheless, they have a fundamental desire to achieve goodness and excellence. And this must involve a desire to understand them correctly. To think that returning a weapon to a madman would be unjust means that the borrower must be aware of something more than that, than that the action is wrong. He must also be aware that the action is of, is of a kind, which makes it contrary to the way in which the just person standardly judges the worth of returning borrowed things. So, against Kephalas, he argues that a life lived in accordance with justice may not be a just life. The capacity to recognize what is just or unjust appears to be distinct from the disposition to tell the truth and to fulfill obligations. In other words, to be able to attribute to character a person's capacity to recognize justice means that we cannot define or understand the just character as merely the disposition to behave in certain ways. When he, the, the son, uh, Polemarchus, takes up the argument of his father, Cephalus, Socrates argues that the way justice works or functions can never lead a person to harm anyone. The excellence of justice cannot be separated from a concern to promote and safeguard the goodness of that with which it deals. Polemarchus's notion of rendering what is fitting to everyone implies that persons are engaged in just activity if the benefit or harm their actions bring to others is knowledgeably produced. Socrates's analogy with craft knowledge is a powerful one here, since whether a craftsman does the right thing in the exercise uh, uh, in the exercise of his skills, is de determined by reference to the product of that skill. This forces Polemicus to consider the implications of his view of justice. If just persons benefit friends and harm enemies, because this is the fitting thing to do, then there will be a field or subject matter of justice and a product or outcome of it, with reference to which the just activity will be judged. Polemicus' view does not distinguish between acting justly and acting from what is deemed to be socially acceptable. Polemicus' notion of justice overlooks the powers of justice, the capacity to achieve a certain type of actual excellence which the just person, qua just person, must of necessity possess. A person's success in bringing off certain results bespeaks a skill 
only if the success is due to the exercise of knowledgeable capacities or activities. If the just are virtuous, one would expect that their aim would, to be, would be to achieve the ends set by the virtue itself, irrespective of what is demanded of them by various social relationships in which we find ourselves at any given time. <clears throat> Take medicine, for example. It has a field by reference to which we can determine what the goals of the physician as physician are, and the respects in which the physician is most capable of acting well, irrespective of the benefits those who use the physician's skill may or may not attain. Socrates is pressing Polemicus to acknowledge that there is room for an analogous distinction between, on the one hand, the field and goals that justice as a virtue sets, and on the other hand, the usefulness of such a virtue to social relationships. Polemicus's failure to identify any specific aims of justice has the further consequence that he cannot justifiably declare to be unjust acts that are commonly held to be so, such as theft and perjury. To think that to be just is to help one's friends and harm one's enemies means that we cannot reject any instances of the exercise of these capacities on the grounds of injustice. The important point about a craft and its product is that the goodness of the activities the skill involves is not judged by reference to values external to the product, but to the nature of the product itself. The goodness of just actions must reside in the fact that they bring about what justice aims at, not in the fact that justice is thought to be desirable or useful on some other grounds. Socrates' critique of Polemicus brings out the moral and conceptual inadequacies in the idea of justice which accompanied the social and political developments in Athens of the time with the emergence of the notion of civic justice, which is a notion that I think we still uh, stick with to a very large extent. This promoted an ethos preoccupied with the idea of receiving and administering justice and in doing so, it had led to an atrophy of reflection about the human capacity inherent in being just. The effect of this atrophy was that the demands for certain values, justice for example, had come adrift from thinking of these, as values, of these values as the outcomes of the exercise of specific human capacities. The goods demanded had come to be seen and delivered by institution as goods which people consume or receive. The second stage of Socrates' arguments explores in a more positive fashion the sources of the inadequacy in Polemicus's defense of justice. He argues that unless those designated as friends are just and good, and those designated as enemies are evil and unjust, benefiting friends and harming enemies which on Polemicus' definition is just, could turn out to harm the good and just and to benefit the evil and the unjust. For Socrates, the question becomes whether incapacitating an enemy is a just thing to do if it makes the enemy incapable of being just. As pointed out, a central function of the craft analogy is to convey, convey the internality of relations between skillful acts and their products or outcomes. He points to two important respects in which the relation between acting justly and acting and excellence must be internal. Firstly, the effect of acting justly upon recipients should be internally related to the capacity in the agents to affect those they act upon with the good aimed at by the just agent. Acting justly must be a communicator of goodness. Secondly, if justice is to be thought of as having an invariant effect upon or in whom it acts, its characteristic work, its ergon, must be characterized as analogs to powers in nature, such as dryness or heat. The natural operation of justice in anything or anyone is to make just, just as heat heats and dryness dries, 
justice, justice, just, sir. Justice imparts its good. The natural operation of justice in anything or anyone is to make just, just as the way, just as the action of heat is to heat. Taking justice to be essentially good requires that we view it as a power, an invariant tendency to bring things its own essential character, to benefit them by making good. The central argument taken up next by Socrates in the exposition of the notion of justice as a power of the soul is, uh, is an attack upon uh, Thrasymachus. Now, Thrasymachus, to a very large extent, uh, is an embodiment of uh, what in international relations they would now call positivism uh, or realism, the idea that power is its own justification. And Plato's uh, through, through Socrates is trying to undermine this very powerful contemporary position. <clears throat> there are two stages of Socrates' examination of Thrasymachus. In the first part, Socrates attempts to undermine the links Thrasymachus forges between power and being unjust, and pre between injustice and excellence. And in the second stage, he tries to explain why he thinks the life of justice is more enabling than the life of injustice. Under the first set of uh, uh, examinations, Socrates needs to argue that the knowledge which makes one skillful as a ruler does not have as its object the promotion of the ruler's own benefit or advantage. And secondly, he needs to argue that the use of wisdom in the service of pleonexia is antithetical to a use of this ability to achieve what is good. And in both cases, Socrates has to show that the excellent person is more like the just person than the unjust person. And the crucial point in Socrates' arguments is that it is the ruler's knowledge which makes him truly pow powerful. Now, the craftsman, the craftsman's knowledge can be seen as an exercise of power not so much because of his ability to produce certain results, but because the craft itself is a way of overcoming or of bringing under rational control circumstances in a given field which are natural sources of resistance or deficiency or inadequacy. The crafts are reasoned and knowledgeable responses to that in things which need to be controlled. The objects of the crafts are things considered under the description of having such needs. The power that a craft gives to its practitioners is that which it has over its objects. More precisely, over those features of its objects which need or require its exercise. This power derives from its ability to meet the needs or requirements of what it deals with. The specific benefits it yields are consequently tied to meeting those needs. There may be other benefits one can obtain from the exercise of a craft, but they are not benefits specific to the nature or the power of that craft. They depend upon other contingent factors which are external to the craft as a craft. Now this is of crucial importance because it anticipates the central ideas about ruling in the ideal city later in the Republic, namely the notion that such a city or polis is constructed on a consideration of needs and the idea that knowledge should be the only source of political authority. Socrates is not arguing that the only thing that motivates practitioners of a craft is to benefit the object of the craft. He is concerned to establish whether and how the knowledge which constitutes a, a craft introduces the idea of an interest that is specific to that craft. If there is such an interest, no ruler could fail to have it if ruling is a craft. The question is whether any such knowledge interest can be a self-interest. The knowledge interest of the craftsman is for Socrates subordinate to the interest one has in the products of the craft. Socrates thus suggests a different conception of the benefits of a skill, one which locates them not in the fact that people deem the products of those crafts to be desirable, 
but in the impersonal or objective fact that the craft meets needs which arise out of natural weaknesses or deficiencies. Thrasymachus's praise of injustice is based on the fact that he regards it as more profitable. But his grounds for thinking so are that the qualities which make for successful injustice on a grand scale are manifestations of excellence. This is why Thrasymachus conceives of injustice as good counsel. Now, the import of Socrates' arguments lies in what they suggest, that understanding various kinds of limits to be placed on human action is the kind of expertise involved in justice. And his example here is tuning an instrument. He says, a good musician uh, tunes an instrument until it's in tune and never desires to be more in tune. It's, that's a disordered desire. So it's, a, it's meeting objective limitations. Socrates argues that if, like the unjust person, your motive in acting is always to achieve more, then you're simply unintelligent. In the exercise of crafts, intelligence is lo located in knowing what is required, and thus in not wanting to have more than the expert, or than what is the right amount. Though Socrates' aim is to separate the unjust man's pleonexia from the proper exercise of intelligence, he does so by linking intelligence to a certain type of motivation, a type that resembles that of the just more than the unjust. The key to the whole argument is this resemblance between the motive of the just and the motive of the knowledgeable qua knowledgeable. <coughs> Excuse me. His first question to Thrasymachus attempts to extract from him the admission that if pleonexia, pleonexia is the motivation of the unjust as he thinks of them, then the motivation of those he thinks of as just will be the opposite, anti-pleonexic. To be expressive of pleonexia, the desire to have more must be understand, understood in a sense which involves disproportion or some kind of inappropriateness. It must be a desire to have more than what is needed or what meets an objective need in the context. So a plain exit desire is the desire to have more than anyone else, whether or not the desire of others in the context is that of the just or the unjust persons. And it is also the desire to have more than the right amount. Now Socrates here is offering an important insight into moral psychology. Pleonexia, the grasping wish to have more, is a form of excessive ambition, an inclination to beat limits, to act as if there were no objective system of order governing the context of an action. And the just person's motivation cannot be character characterized simply by, uh, by the absence of pleonexia. It has to be positive, thus it is anti-pleonexic. With the craft analogy, again, Socrates attempts to show a resemblance in the motivational structure between the knowledgeable and the just, and the ignorant and the unjust. Skillful activity in a certain field is both instigated and controlled by considerations of the imperfections in a field of skill. And we learn that overcoming these imperfections has to do with the discovery of objective limits in the processes and operations constitutive of a certain uh, field's craft, of a particular craft's field. It is the standard of the rational, the desire of the knowledgeable in that field which, const which constitutes the standard for rational desire. The desires of the knowledgeable qua knowledgeable are rational because they are correct. It's a circular argument. The knowledgeable are motivated by a desire to fit what is the case in a given situation. <clears throat> in contrast, the desires of the ignorant are pleonexic in that they conflict both with correct and unrealistic desires. Knowledgeable pursuit of an activity imposes its own internal restrictions on a person's desire or wishes. And now, that's, that's basically what you've got from the three key writers who have elaborated some of the features of what it might be like to think about justice as a power of the soul. Here's the bit that I would really like some help with, 
I'm trying to think my way through this uh, uh, in order to write a, a book. And while I've got the, uh, it's probably going to be a double volume work, um, while I've got the first part very well sorted in my head, which is the analysis of contemporary accounts of justice and their inadequacies, and I've got the historical dimension uh, pretty well articulated of, of the three key arenas in which justice is explored as a virtue of the soul in the Western tradition. It's the implications of this view that I'm very worried about, and I don't really know where I'm going. So if any of you are interested in this, I'd be very grateful if you could uh, have a chat with me uh, after uh, we finish up now. So here's, here's what we're left with. Modern accounts of justice emphasize impartiality. The Platonic emphasizes impersonality. In this sense, it is anti-individualistic. The two models, the contemporary impartial view and the Platonic impersonal view, are different in that they conceive differently what is important about individuals. And they're also, also different as models for dealing with human situations. They exemplify different structures. The impartial contemporary perspective attends to how an individual is placed rather than what kind of individual he or she is. This is because impartiality has to deal with claims that people make and not with whether such individuals are happy, fulfilled, or frustrated. From the impersonal perspective, what matters in a situation of conflict or competing demands is why individuals feel the need to make certain claims rather than the mere fact that they make them. The impersonal perspective must reverses the priorities implicit in the impartial standpoint. It is individuals as possessors of needs and the forces that generate them rather than as generators of claims and possessors of entitlements, which is of fundamental importance. Moreover, impartiality is structurally individualistic even when the situation involves groups or nations rather than individuals. <clears throat> this is because it is committed to attending to what in a situation of competing claims constitutes a relevant difference between the parties. By contrast, the impersonal perspective is structurally holistic. What one looks for whether in groups, individuals, communities, or social mo movements, are similar forces and impulses. This is because one hopes to detect the patterns in human living, wherever they are found, that are responsible for enhancing or diminishing the powers of such living, and thus making it good or bad living. In wanting to do the good of another, the just person cannot give impartial and due attention to competing demands. The just person must assess impersonally whether the having of these demands is in the circumstances a good thing, and whether their satisfaction would make people good or bad. So the account of justice that I'm drawing from the Platonic perspective requires that not only beliefs but practices, aspirations, and desires be vetted to ensure that they do not set up patterns generative of injustice. And just to close off the paper, and I've still got six minutes left, so I've done well here. Um, what I'd like to do is, is tease this out in terms of what would, this, what, would, what would it look like if we thought of justice as a power of the soul and then extended it to our institutional perspectives. What would our institutions look like? It's the kind of idea that says something like, you know, in contemporary business reality, people will very up set a, a, a code of conduct or a, a, a system of ethics. And people look at those and forget about them the next day. Whereas this idea is that the people who generate the, the nature of the business or the enterprise or whatever it is, if they are good, if they bring justice to, justice to the situation, 
the, 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 the nature of that institution is made just by that nature. So it's rather reversing the priorities of contemporary accounts of justice. Thank you very much.